Saquon Barkley just held a mini camp for over 150 inner city kids. But once that camp finished, focus quickly shifted to his contract situation with the Giants. I'm going to go through some of his very interesting comments and will a deal get done or not. All coming up next on Tommy's Takes. It's time for another episode of Tommy's Takes, covering all things New York Giants. What's up, Giants fans? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tommy's Takes. As always, I'm your host, Tommy G. Got a great show lined up for you tonight. Please hit that subscribe button, turn notifications on. You can also catch Tommy's Takes on Spotify.com. Check me out on Twitter, TommyG105. Giants Country is my team, one of the best collectives of content creators, reporters, analysts, reviews, previews, interviews. When it comes to great Giants content, if you want it, Giants Country got it. So let's get started. Saquon Barkley holding a mini camp for inner city children yesterday. Over 150 kids in attendance. First and foremost, you love to see it. Love to see players get back to their community. Get these kids on the right road of athletics. That was awesome. He was joined by some of his teammates, including Darren Waller, Dane Belton, Micah McFadden. But even with mandatory minicamp here, that's probably going to be the closest he gets to seeing his teammates on the field. Listening to some of the comments Barkley made, doesn't seem like there's been much ground made between himself, his representatives, Joe Shane, Giants front office. Before we get to his comments... Let's do a little bit of a backstory for anybody out there that hasn't been following this Saquon Barkley contract saga. Giants go to Barkley in the bye week of the 2022 season, put out an offer of supposedly $12.5 million. Barkley and his representatives declined that offer. Once the season ended, a season that featured the Giants winning their first playoff game in over a decade, Joe Shane got back to the table, offered $13 million a season, we don't know how much the guaranteed money is, which is really unfortunate in this situation because I happen to think it's not the AAV, the average annual value. I think it's the guaranteed money that's really the sticking point here with Barkley. And you can't blame him when you have a running back and their shelf life is very short, get hit more than anybody on the field. That guaranteed money is critical. But what we do know is it was $12.5 million at the bye week, declined. $13 million after the season, declined. A what ensued shortly after that, not a lot of people could expect. A running back market that was in a downturn for a couple years just absolutely plummeted off of a cliff. Top running back from last season, Josh Jacobs, hit with the franchise tag after rushing for over 1,600 yards and 12 touchdowns. He was franchise tagged. Miles Sanders, Philadelphia Eagles, wasn't even offered a deal after rushing for over 1,200 yards. Gets himself a deal, just under $7 million a year. Ezekiel Elliott came up with the Cowboys, drafted by the Cowboys, beloved by Cowboys fans, not even offered a contract, released by the Cowboys. Austin Eckler, star running back for the Chargers. He can catch, he could run, he can do everything. They told him, hey, if you want to trade, go find yourself a trade partner. Derrick Henry, most considered the best running back in the league, Lots of rumors out there about him being shocked. Teams have been trying to distance themselves from the high-paid, top-tier running backs the entire offseason. But this offseason was different. It was dramatic. And it was constant and it was nonstop. And Joe Shane had his eye on the market. His next move, pulling the last offer from the table for Saquon Barkley. And I think that's where a lot of this got screwed up between Joe Shane, the front office, Barkley, and his representatives. But you can't really blame the GM for that. Barkley several times during his impromptu interview, it's a business. It's a business. It's a business. If you were hiring someone, you offered them $20 an hour, they declined it. All of a sudden, the next couple weeks, you're seeing the same position being filled for $17 an hour, $16 an hour, $17 an hour. As a business owner whose job is to protect assets of the team, Grow sales and revenue? Grow top-line sales? What would you do? But this is where the conundrum came from. During the draft, Joe Shane says, hey, we want Barkley to be a giant. 
we're going to get back to the table. We're going to make something happen. Then you hear, let's say a month after that, no progress has been made between the two sides. Dalvin Cook, another elite running back for the Minnesota Vikings, released after the Vikings could not even find a trade partner of any sort of deal because of what Dalvin Cook was set to make. And that leads us to right now. Mandatory minicamp is here. The two sides seem no closer than they were at the bye week. And the deadline is fast approaching. July 17th is breathing down both sides neck and back right now. Very, very interesting time in here. As I said last week, you were going to start to hear more stories of Barkley now that this minicamp is mandatory. The first mandatory minicamp. Obviously, last week I didn't know about his camp this weekend and that he was going to talk and he was going to give some interviews. Let's talk about those interviews because if you read between the lines, and I'm not a big person that's going to speculate, that's going to throw salt, put a little sauce into stuff, a little bit of seasoning. I'm going to give it to you real. I'm going to give you what I think, but I'm never going to amp stuff up for views, for more followers. Not my style. I'd rather give it to you real, honest, and if I'm right, cool, I'm right. Let's take a couple of looks at the interesting nuggets from that Barkley interview. So, there were two quotes that really stood out to me above anything else. First and foremost, the word respect had to be thrown around about six, seven times by Barkley. Don't think it has to do with the money that was offered to him either. The respect issue apparently stems from a betrayal of trust with inaccurate information being released, contract details being leaked. This is important for several reasons, so... Players play. That's their job, right? They get on the field. They perform. They do what they have to do. They're not typically in the business side. Most of them will only see one to two contracts in their lifetime when you look at the actual NFL player lifespan. So they're not used to this. They're not used to a difficult negotiation where the organization will downplay the player's value to get a better deal for the team. Where the organization may leak sensitive information that makes that player look greedy or that he's not working with the team and he doesn't want to take one for the proverbial team. Throw in the fact that the offer was pulled makes this a very tenuous situation right now with Barkley, Joe Shane, John Mara, and it's going to make disagreement to, disagreement they're trying to come to even more difficult. Saquon was asked, what will it take to get a deal done? Says at the end of the day, there's been information that's been misleading. I've been honest. I want to be a giant for life. And at the end of the day, it's about respect. They know what it's going to take to get a deal done. So Barkley told you right there, his number is out there. We're not going to call it a final number. His number is out there. The Giants know what it takes to get it done. And he's putting the onus on them. And that's tough. You know, when you look at it, he also says that numbers released were misleading, made him out to look greedy. You know, he spoke about reading between the lines several times, keeping family business in-house. So there's no question he's upset here about stuff that's being leaked. And, and you know, also, you don't know if it's Joe Shane that's leaking this. There could be several members of the front office privy to the details. So it's not automatically Joe Shane releasing and leaking information. So let's not assume that. But somebody is, and obviously Saquon is upset about that. You know, when you really look in between the lines, like he said, he feels disrespected. He feels devalued by Joe Shane, the Giants front office. Simple as that. You know, no better way to put it. So not only are the numbers off on his deal, he's feeling disrespected. He's drawing the line in the sand. Seems like there's some bad blood brewing. Not a good combination with 30-something days left to get this deal done. Another interesting nugget. Barkley spoke about what's going on in the running with the running back market in general. His answer was honest and, in my opinion, accurate. He essentially said not every single team could win with a lower tier running back. He then mentioned Patrick Mahomes. Not every team has a Patrick Mahomes. You can kind of understand that. Daniel Jones not on the level of Patrick Mahomes, let's be honest. They mentioned the Eagles, which was very choice words, said they have Jalen Hurts, but they have a really great team, great team. It's like as soon as he said Jalen Hurts, he tried to go into the team. They have such a great team. I think that's what he meant. 
I don't think he was comparing Jones and Hurts. I think what he was trying to say is they have a solid quarterback and they have a great team around him. That's why they don't need that top tier of running back. But obviously people have jumped on it. People are saying he's he's saying that Daniel Jones is average. You know, he also mentioned the offense being one dimensional last season for the most part more or more towards the bit, beginning, middle of the season. I don't think he's insulting Jones at all. I really don't. I think he's just speaking some truths. I mean, listen, you know, Giants offense struggled to start the year in the passing game. Barkley took over. He put the team on his back, career high in carries, 1,300 rushing yards, 12 touchdowns, including the playoffs. And he feels undervalued. So he's making some comparisons here. Like I said, I don't believe his attention was to knock Jones, but the fifth-year quarterback for the Giants still has some developing to do. Let's just be honest. Before Daniel Jones could take the reins of this offense fully, and the Giants could say, hey, we got our playmaker, we got our quarterback, we added some pieces, he still has some developing to do. Now, that's a risk Joe Shane is going to have to take. If he doesn't want to meet Barkley where the number is, he's going to have to say, okay, Daniel Jones, you're going to have to be that guy. You're not going to have Barkley. This one's on you. That's a risky proposition. Now, Daniel Jones was a lot better down the stretch in the second half last season. Posted QB ratings of 125, 92, 78, 96, 104, 89, 74, and 153 in the final eight games and the, and the wild card game. Not going to throw a divisional playoff game in there. Nobody played well. But, you know, some still question his ability to put the offense on his back. Let's be honest. And, you know, many look to that divisional playoff game where the Eagles shut down Barkley in the first half and Daniel Jones could not do it on his own. Flat out. It was one of Jones' worst games of the year. Um, Eagles took away that Russian attack early. Jones didn't have an answer. Giants receivers didn't have an answer. It was a struggle. So that's a, that's some of the nuggets, some of the interesting points. You know, um, I don't think he sounded frustrated. I don't think he sounded mad, sounded upset personally but when you look into some of those things i mean truth is truth so i mean i want to go back to a point here you know with daniel jones can he lead an offense without saquon barkley everyone wants to point to the eagles game the eagles game it was a brutal game he didn't play well giants got blown out remember that eagles defense had probably the greatest pass rush in nfl history they, almost, they would have broke the pass rush record, but the Giants stifled them in that regular season finale. Also have two number one cornerbacks in Bradbury and Slay. So not making any excuses, but you got to take the grain of salt here with that defense. That was a no-joke defense. I think they gave up one 300-yard passing game the entire season. You know, let's go back to the Giants versus Green Bay in London. Barkley goes down late in the second half. Jones leads them on a 90-plus yard drive with his feet, with his arm. That was clutch. You know, we look at the wild card playoff game. The Giants said to the Vikings, your pass defense can't stop us. We're going to throw the ball. What does Daniel Jones do? 300-plus yards passing, 70-plus yards rushing. First player in NFL history to do that with two touchdowns. So I do think Jones is getting to that point where he can put the offense on his back. Um, it might be one of those things where you're just going to have to see. You're going to have to put him out there without Barkley, see what happens, see what he could do, if that's the case. You know, in my opinion, Barkley sitting out the entire season would be the worst possible uh, outcome for Saquon Barkley. You know, first off, the Giants still have his rights. They could tag him in 2024 if they want to tag him. You know, if Barkley is hoping he sits out the year and then, you know, uh, Giants don't won't want to tag him and he could hit the open market. I mean, there's no signs pointing to this running back market starting to ascend. It's been nothing but the opposite. You're asking a lot if you're saying I'm going to sit out this season, hope the Giants don't tag me next year and then hit the open market and get a big deal. That's kind of fairy tale stuff, in my opinion. Listen, you have, you know, we could make an example. Steelers, Le'Veon Bell, risked it all in 2018, right? 2017, they tagged him, wasn't going to play, ended up playing. 2018, they tagged him again. 
He did get a big check eventually from the Jets, but lost a ton of money in the process and was never the same player again after taking that time off. So, I mean, it's a bad example for Barkley. Good example for the Giants for, hey, don't sit out. You know, for the record, I don't think Barkley will sit out. I think this comes down to the final minutes. Hopefully they can get a deal done. If not, Barkley will probably sit out camp, come back a little bit, you know, right before week one. Barkley doesn't have a lot of leverage. Barkley's only leverage here is, hey, I will I will miss games. You will not have me for games. And he is extremely valuable. He is a critical part of this offense. But is that enough? Is that leverage enough to push Joe Shane? Unfortunately for Barkley, the date is not on his side. Last four Super Bowl winning teams did not possess that high-end elite running back. We're going to go into some contracts that went wrong for running backs right after the drop. All right, let's take a look. Let's take a look at how history is not on Saquon Barkley's side. We're just going to example a few high-paid running back contracts. Obviously, not every running back contract turned out this way, but there's a startling trend here. Let's go David Johnson, Arizona Cardinals. Signs a three-year, $39 million deal in 2017. Suffers a wrist injury in the season opener. Caused him to miss the remainder of the season. Also deals with ankle, back, foot injuries during this extension. Impacted his performance availability. Was never the same player after he signed the contract. Devonta Freeman, Atlanta Falcons. Signs a five-year, $41 million deal in 2017. Dealt a series of injuries, knee, foot, groin. Caused him to miss significant amounts of time in the 2018-19 seasons. Falcons released him in March of 2020. Chris Johnson. CJ2K, everybody remembers him. You know, Mr. 4-1-4-2-40 speed. Signs a four-year, $53 million deal. 2011, didn't suffer any major injury, but he was one of the first running backs that you really seen fall off a cliff when he got that big deal. I mean, he was never the same either. Well, Le'Veon Bell, one of the most famous cases. After sitting out the entire season in 2018, Gets a four-year, $52 million deal from the Jets, which I know they regret. I know they wish they could do that over again. Gets a hamstring injury in 2020, early, released by October 2020. The Rams, this is also one of the more famous uh, bad contracts for running backs, older running backs. They cut Todd Gurley just two years after giving him a $57 million extension due to injuries, lack of production, like I said, not every high-priced running back has the same outcome. But these could really hurt franchises. You know, giving a running back $40, $50 million and he's gone in a year or two, devastating. You know, especially when you look at a Giants team that's young, up and coming. Joe Shane keeps talking about salary cap help. They're going into 2024 looking good. The cap is raised. It's going to be a good free agent class. Does he want to? Give Barkley a three-year deal. Does he want to give Barkley 30, 35 million guaranteed? That's what he's going to have to ask himself. You know, another factor in why teams don't want to pay second contracts to running backs, the NFL game has changed. Offenses have changed. You know, when you used to need an elite running back because defenses would stack the box no matter what, and you had to break that one tackle, you needed that elite running back, you don't see it as much anymore. Defenses are spread out more. They're willing to give a light box to give you some rushing yards. Basically, any running back can go in there and get four or five yards as long as you're not hitting a 50, 60 yard pass. It's very interesting, you know, when you look at it. Those lighter boxes have really made it to where you don't need that critical running back. You could send that fifth, sixth round pick out there. Go get four or five yards. They're not going to hit you to you two yards deep, anyways. You know, back then, coaches would call that run play, and you're running it no matter what. Need to make that defender miss for that run play to be successful. Also, let's be honest. This is a passing league. How did the Giants make get their first playoff win in over a decade? Daniel Jones has one of his best passing performances of his career. 
also contributing on the ground. These are just a few examples of why paying a running back a second contract typically doesn't work out. Now, I do think things have become a little too one-sided when you have the three top running backs in free agency all get uh, uh, franchise tagged and they can't see what their value is. They can't set a value. I think that's crazy. You know, when they get back with this collective bargaining agreement, I don't know if it's, hey, we're going to pay running backs more coming out of college because you're going to have kids not wanting to play running back. And running back used to be the glorious position in the NFL. The superstar, the Barry Sanders, the Emmitt Smiths, Walter Payton. It's scary how that's changed. And I think it's, it's, it's a little too lopsided now. I really do. You know, certain offenses need an elite running back still. I really believe that. And Barkley hit that one right on the head. And I don't think it was just an insult to Jones. The Giants are one of those offenses or were one of those offenses last year. They have no clear-cut number one receiver. Mediocre offensive line, a young, growing, but mediocre offensive line. Let's be honest, right? They got Waller. Waller's going to be their main um, threat downfield. But this offense doesn't still doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy. That, hey, you know what, Barkley? Dang, sit out. We're not worried about it. You coming at what we want. Doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy, does it? Now, I expect the Giants offense to change a lot in 2023. You've seen it down the stretch last year. Teams keyed in to stop Barkley. Forced the Giants away from the bootlegs, the RPOs, the running nonstop into more of a conventional pass-first offense. I think you see that even more now with Darren Waller, Parrish Campbell, Jalen Hyatt. You know, do the Giants use Barkley more in the receiving game? That was an interesting factor in, in year one of Dable Kafka. Didn't really use Barkley a lot in the receiving game. Might have had something to do with the heavy load that he was bearing with the running game and career high in carries. But <clears throat> there's a lot of questions here still. I mean, you know, can Barkley stay healthy? Played every game last season, but that was the first time since his rookie year. When he got banged up, he dealt with the neck, he dealt with the shoulder. Kudos to him for fighting through that, not taking anything away there. <clears throat> but do you give him $30 million guaranteed and he gets hurt this season? That's something you have to ask. I'm not saying that's going to happen. not saying I don't want the Giants to sign Barkley, but if you're on the other end of that checkbook, you have to ask yourself, can he get hurt again this season? Is it worth this investment? Not, not that he is he worth that as a player or as a person, but what are the likelihoods here? What are the percentages? <clears throat> you know, is, is Matt Breida and Gray enough? Are they enough to shoulder the load? Brightwell, whoever's back there. Are they enough to back up Daniel Jones? These are all valid questions. And I think that's why this deal hasn't gotten done yet. <clears throat> Both sides have made mistakes in this deal. Giants have made mistakes. I think actually their offers were too high in the beginning. Barkley and his representatives have continued to make mistakes. Not taking the offers that were on the table. Wanting north of $17 million, supposedly, to start this. I don't know what's going on right now, what number they're at, what they want. Obviously, that's not out there, but there's been mistakes made by both sides. I think at the end of the day, Saquon Barkley needs the Giants. The Giants need Saquon Barkley at least for one more season. That's why I think they'll get a deal done. But it does scare me when you hear things from Barkley like family business, respect, hurt, disrespected, lies. When you hear stuff like that, misled, that does scare you when it comes to a contract negotiation. Those are not positive things when you have 30 plus days left to get this deal done. Like I said, I don't think... Barkley will sit out the entire season. It makes no sense. He's going to lose $10 million, cross his fingers that something great happens next offseason, that the Giants don't retag him, he hits the open market. You know, the NFL rewinds back 5, 10 years, and he gets a $50 million deal. And for the Giants, you got to hope that Daniel Jones is ready to take the next step. Because Saquon Barkley was the star of that team for the 8, 10 first games. Just being honest. So, going to be interesting. We don't know what the outcome will be. Um, 
we'll start to hear a little bit more, I think, as we get towards that July 17th deadline. But you didn't really like what you heard from Barkley. Um, nothing really positive. Nothing that led you to believe a deal was about to get done. They were moving in the right direction. I gave you some examples tonight of how these contracts don't work. I gave you some examples of why the Giants do still need Barkley. The question is who breaks? Who goes further towards the other side? That's going to be the interesting part. And what's the outcome, right? You know, I, I would think that most likely, you know, if I had to put money on it, Joe Shane doesn't give in. Barkley has to sit out until week one, and he comes in, and he's ready to play, and that bad blood is there, but he's like, you know what? I'm going to play. I need that $10 million. Let's make it happen. That's what my belief would be. I think at this point I'd be a little surprised if they got a multi-year deal done. Especially hearing some of those things from Barkley yesterday. Not what you want to hear. You know, not hearing a lot from the Giants side, which is not necessarily telling. You won't hear a lot anyways, but paying running backs a second contract. Paying a running back that's been injured the majority of his career a second contract. Very, very scary proposition. And the only reason why this is even a discussion is because Barkley is a special player. He is that guy that can make plays. He is a superstar running back. He is the heart and soul of this team. He's been the face of this team, even though the team hasn't been great. I hear people throwing that around. Well, they've been bad anyways. That's not on him. He did what he could when he was healthy. But Joe Shane has a very difficult decision to make. And I'm not going to predict it. Like I said, if I had, if I was a betting man, I would say he plays on the franchise tag. He sits out all the way up till week one. Plays week one, Sunday night versus Dallas. But who knows? Maybe they can get a deal done. Maybe not. Either way, this thing's going to drag on a little bit longer. You make sure you keep it locked to Tommy's takes. I'll keep you in tune with all the information, all the details as soon as I get it. But for tonight, we're done. Thank you for tuning in again, everybody. I appreciate you. Hit that subscribe button. Download Tommy's takes on Spotify. Check me out on Twitter, TommyG105. Giants country is the team. For now, peace.